and welcome to the Fleet Geeks podcast. We're here to help develop fleet and transport professionals. Do you want to progress and develop your skills and knowledge? We promise to bring lively conversation and debate around interesting issues and keep you bang up to date with changes in our awesome industry. The Fleet Geeks are a community of professionals and if you enjoy the podcast, why not join the discussion for free in the Fleet Geek community over on Facebook. Hi guys, it's Shani welcoming you back to Fleet Geeks and today we have the CEO Pete Rushma joining us, your usual host but as a guest today. Woohoo! Nice intro, well done. You can get a bit closer to the microphone now, they won't have been able to hear you. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go. So, let's do this. Why I wanted to sit down with you today is to pretty much get more of an insight um, around what made you start Flagship Partners, how you got to this point, and then hopefully share some wisdom with up-and-coming entrepreneurs and um, hopefully inspire some people. Nice. Inspiration. I like it. Let's go. What you got for me? So. Hello, you... everyone, by the way. What a nice introduction Shani did there. I think she's going to be a pro at this. We'll see. Hi everyone, it's Shani and welcome to today's Fleet Geeks podcast. I love it. Anyway, let's get cracking. So. All action, no filler. All thriller, no filler. That's what, that's, that's a new thing. Love it. All, all thriller, no filler. You need to remember it first. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. All thriller, no filler. Love it. But if you could just let some of the listeners know um, how you got to this point. First of all. How did I get to what today? What or get to, to today? I would say more of starting flagship partners. Obviously, okay. a lot of people that have known you for a while, probably some of our avid listeners will know, um, but maybe okay. for our new listeners. Okay, cool. So, uh, oh man, uh, I guess I guess I never knew what I wanted to do, right? So I ended up doing this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, um, I left school. I was lucky. I was pretty good at school. But I'm a college dropout. Um, I went to sixth form. I only did a year, and then I left to be a chef. And then my career took off from wanting to be a chef. In fact, I didn't want to be any chef. I wanted to be Jamie Oliver. I wanted to be like a celebrity chef. Was what I wanted to do once upon a time. Genuine. I was going to be a celebrity chef. Um, but I ended up getting a bit fed up with it, and uh, I got my alcohol license when I was eighteen, so I can run pubs and nightclubs and all that sort of stuff. But I got fed up of the late nights and drunk people generally. So I kind of went as far away from possible as drunk people as I could and and started working in vehicles and automotive and that sort of stuff. So yeah, I used to, I worked my way up uh, as a young lad doing a, um, uh, doing like a traineeship as as a damage assessor for accident damage vehicles. And then uh, this sort of led me on to some managerial roles and I went and worked for Volvo Trucks and I realised that there was like this whole community of cool vehicle operators who ran really cool businesses that I really enjoyed working with. They were really down to earth people and they just wanted to go out and run a good business. But the whole complexities of operator licensing were a real challenge. And I realised that with the challenges I'd faced myself when I was running the vehicles for the Accident Repair Centre, because I used to run their vehicles, and then also coming into contact with them through running the maintenance and, and workshops for Volvo as well, that actually this whole operator license thing is a bit complicated and there's loads of pitfalls and banana skins and challenges and people really struggled with it. And I was lucky that I had a really good understanding and grasp for it. And I realised that, um, you know, I could really help serve those people. And um, it's just kind of gone from there. And then, you know, all of the passions that I've got around good leadership and performance and management strategy and people engagement and um, getting people to believe in safety and for them to believe in compliance and all of that sort of stuff that sort of led me led me on a bit of a journey and a path and wanting to be you know essentially working on my own self-mastery right because um, whenever the finished article that's kind of led me to where we are today with doing all the different stuff that we do um, because it's my passion how was that for an answer? Was that okay? That was a very good answer. Was it? Oh, good. Not that it's a test. Oh, okay, I was going to say, <clears throat> 10 out of 10 for that one. Good. <laughs> How many points is available for this one, Miss Shani? I'm not going to share that. Oh, okay, cool. Right, okay, we'll just see, shall we? What have we got? So, have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? 
That's a really good question. And I think I did, to be honest, I did. I think I didn't really know what an entrepreneur was. And I've had a bit of a challenge around that title as well. And like coming to realize that that is what I am. Mm -hmm. Um, But if the cap fits, you wear it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously, I'm not just an entrepreneur. I'm an award-winning entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. That was disgusting, <laughs> wasn't it? That's self-flagellation. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, I always, yeah, I always wanted to work for myself. I've never been good. I've never been good at taking instructions from other people. Uh, personified by the fact that I walked out of school after one year of A-levels when I should have stuck around for longer. But I just didn't get a lot. I didn't like getting told what to do. I have this thing. So motivational maps when you, but you know, if people ever come to me for a motivational map, which I highly recommend, I'm what's called a, a high spirit and high builder and high searcher. And they're gen, that is generally the map of an entrepreneur. So a spirit is somebody who likes freedom and autonomy. Um, and I don't really, I tend to try and live between the different rules and expectations and that sort of stuff, which is why I'm sat here today in shorts and t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Got the legs out. Got the guns out, yeah. What would you say your core values that drive you to uh, your leadership and decision making within the business? And don't just say our core values, which are family, loyalty, confidence and trust. Oh, okay, that's a challenge. Right, okay, so <laughs> what are my values? Or what? What are the? What values do you try to instill when leading your your business? Okay, so I've got a personal set of values. I've got a personal set of values, which as an entrepreneur, um, I live by, and those four are courage, discipline, justice, and temperance, which is an old style word for discipline. Did I say that already? Yeah. So courage. You- sorry, courage, wisdom temperance which is also discipline and justice and they're the four they're the four uh virtues of stoic philosophy and i live by those as a person and as an entrepreneur and those are the things i believe in so um every day i journal and i'll write down what are the things that have made me proud around the courage that i've shown or the discipline or giving justice or the wisdom that I've gained or whatever that might be from, from the day and I reflect on those things. But yeah, so those are the four, they're my four pillars um, that I try and live my life by both as an entrepreneur, as a parent, as a friend, as a father, as a husband, as a son. They're, nice. my, they're my four pillars. What was the rest of the question? Would you say you also feel like those four drive your style of leadership yeah sure so okay so let's take courage for example right so it was I think I'm very proud of the courage that I showed in leaving a full-time job that I wasn't happy in Mm -hmm. um, to start the business and on a daily basis I try and make those courageous decisions it's sometimes not about what's doing what's easy but what's the right thing to do excuse me so courage is shown there, but it's also in like risk taking and calculated risk taking. So it's about investing in things. It's about seeing an opportunity and having the courage to go for them. But it's also about instilling that belief and courage in other people as well. There's a story, you know, the, the thing about courage is there's this thing about belief and the need for belief to achieve stuff, right? So Roger Bannister, people will have heard, uh, is... Um, he was the first guy to run a four minute mile. Have you ever heard that story? No. So Roger Bannister many years ago, people didn't believe that a human could run a mile in four minutes. It was like a, this big barrier. People were running it in just over four minutes. Anyway, Roger Bannister goes and runs a four minute mile and within like three months, five, six other people have run a four minute mile, right? And what that means is, is that proves, that proves that there's a belief in performance, that you have to believe something to be able to achieve it. So, um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but yeah, courage. No, and I get what you mean, because right? my dad always says there's no word as can't. Yeah, yeah, there's no so well. I've got, literally, they, yeah. I've got tattooed on my arm, I can't. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, courage is important. Uh, wisdom, uh, I think the thing with wisdom is knowing that we don't really know anything and that we're just constantly evolving. I used to think that going to school would learn me everything that I needed to learn, and actually I realised that life's a journey of learning and developing and trying new stuff and making mistakes and all that sort of stuff so all the time I'm looking for the wisdom I'm looking for 
improvement, self improvement, mm-hmm. and self mastery. Um, and and I do that within the business as well, right? So it's never a done thing. I'm always looking to, con- and I take that mindset into the business around continuous improvement. Always, you know, whenever there's an issue or something, I'm a pain in the ass to deal with because I want to try and mm-hmm. nip it in the bud and try and deal with it. Um, so that's those. And then from a discipline perspective, I've not been particularly disciplined today. I'm a bit disappointed. I've eaten a lot of chocolate biscuits. Uh, but I try and be disciplined in by, you know, getting enough sleep and eating the right foods and training in the gym and, you know, all of those sorts of things, having the disciplined style. And I like to make sure that there's consequences as well. So I'm not just, it's not just about everything being fluffy all the time. There needs to be, I believe in reward and consequence, right? And that's a bit of discipline as well, right? So when things go well, we reward people. And if things go badly or um, we have... Um, uh, a suboptimal outcomes is a good way of putting it. A suboptimal outcome, then there's consequences for that if bad decisions have been made. And then what was the last one? With uh, justice. So justice is important. So having a just, I believe in justice. I believe in fairness and equity and all of that sort of stuff. So try to make decisions around that. Sorry. One personally that I would say I struggle with is being disciplined. Okay. How have you got your 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 level of discipline to that to that point because from an outside perspective I know you the only one I see you struggle with is sweet treats yeah, besides okay. that you are a very disciplined person yeah. and how do you keep that momentum that's a really good question and I think I think the thing is is that if I wanted to be really disciplined with the sweet stuff I probably could, could be too. you could yeah, I, I could be as well and I think the discipline thing is um it's, it's something that I've got better at over time mm-hmm. um there's this thing like around like this immediacy of like self-gratification and um needing every, this immediacy around and, and young people are getting it more and more you know like I don't know Simon Sinek talks about it like kids now if they want to watch a series mm. they don't have to wait week to week to week they can just binge the whole lot in fact they don't even have to watch the whole series they can just go to the last episode and find out what happens at the end um, and the thing is is that one of the things that I've learned now as an old man of almost 40 is that life isn't just about getting to the end it's about the journey along the way and the thing is is that actually we're not designed we're not, as people, we're not we're not designed to have everything, right? So if we overindulge in everything, if we have too much of anything, then that is um, bad for us. It makes us fat, it makes us lazy, it makes us incompetent. Um, so it's important to make sure that we just have enough of the things that we need and discipline. Discipline helps lead into that and being disciplined. That was a lovely answer. Was it? Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Um... Um, actually, following up from that, if you don't necessarily stay on track, what do you do then? Oh, I literally whip myself, take okay. my shirt off and whip myself. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think, so one of the other things I do when I journal is um, I well, I have the five Fs and one of them is forgiveness. So I work out who, which day, who, who are the people I need to forgive. And uh, sometimes it might be me. Mm. So that's what I do to try and just put it behind me and just recognize that it's just uh you know sometimes we have a slip in our discipline and we just get back on it the next day right you know it's a bit like um i used to smoke right and um i still think i'm a smoker in that i think if i was to have a cigarette now i'd probably be re-addicted again quite quickly um so i am still a smoker i just haven't smoked today and i haven't smoked yesterday and the day before and the day before that and i'm not going to smoke again tomorrow um but i think you have to kind of take that take that mindset around stuff in that like i'm just not going to do that today moving on from your um your values and how do you envision the company's growth and development over the next five years i know in a another podcast we we looked at how i envision it Mm -hmm. but obviously in yeah, a lot my, of ways we're very similar, but yeah. in a lot of ways we're very different. Yeah, yeah. So my vision for flagship is to absolutely dominate the fleet sector with fantastic services and products to help support fleet operators be safer, greener and greater. And the vision for that is for us to become, to go from what we are now, which is a relatively small business, 
in Peterborough that not many people have heard of. And many people listen to the Fleet Geeks podcast, which is beautiful. But I want us to become a powerhouse that is competing with RHA and Logistics UK from a membership perspective, that we have enough of a voice to be able to lobby government around road safety schemes. And um, I have a vision around us having a genuine impact on... I think, I think my goal is, the net result is, there are five people a day die in the UK on the roads. And if we can have any impact on reducing that to three or four, then that's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think as well, following from that, I would definitely want to be a go-to for training providers. Because I feel um, at the moment, a lot of people use certain providers as they have a attachment to some sort of government run business or mm -hmm. if you get what I mean, a public sector. So I think it's taken away that actually just because they're affiliated to those people doesn't mean there's not others that do any the same training great or even better. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, it's not only just our business I want to change that perspective for, it's for other businesses that also provide similar things for uh, mm. than us um, and the same services, so like, things like first aid. I think a lot of people have a go-to, it's just because of how they've um, dominated the market, but it's actually... Are they the best at what they do? Are they providing value? Yeah. Because um, I feel like that's one thing we don't rip off people or over promise yeah. or try sell something that we can't do. Yeah. Um, or doesn't have a fit for purpose. Or do you get what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, I think we we are very careful over the quality of what we provide, and we are fully committed to getting great outcomes for our customers. And I think that there's many businesses out there that aren't customer centric and focused in the way that we are and I just hope I just hope that you know I think the vision for me is that people get on board with the mission and our potential customers will then decide that they want to get on board with that mission too um, you know ultimately which is around improving road safety standards improving driving standards improving you know the way the way we do things but also um, you know I want us to attract the best talent to come mm -hmm. and work for us um, I want, you know, for people to, you know, flagship to literally be, you know, that standout company that, that really compete with the likes of RHA and Logistics UK. Hello, it's Sharni from Flagship Partners. We are really proud to sponsor the Fleet Geeks podcast. If you need expert advice or training for your fleet business, make Flagship Partners your first choice. We are really excited to announce the launch of our Transport Manager Academy with expert development for fleet leaders. We offer fully accredited initial Transport Manager CPC training, CPC refresher and operator license awareness training, as well as mentoring, support and professional development beyond the qualification. Our vision is to develop elite fleet professionals. Do you think we'll ever get free lunch? Free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and bean bags. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, uh, where do I go with that? Uh, the issue I have, I guess the issue I have with free lunch and bean bags is how do we provide it to all the people who are out on the road with customers? That's a fair point. Yeah, so there's a bit of a logistical challenge because they go, oh, well, I'm not going to go and see this customer. I'm not going to go and serve this customer today because I want my free lunch and beanbag rest. And uh, that would defeat the object. So, uh, sorry, guys. I don't think the beanbag and free lunch is coming anytime soon. But we do do, do, we do do free lunches because on occasion because I believe in having team meetings and having regular good communications within the team. And I think that deserves a free lunch. So... Not every day, but maybe 5% yeah. of the time. Is that a good answer? That is a good answer. Okay. How do you um, maintain the energy to be able to foster innovation and creativity and new ideas? Because it's very easy once you've, you've created something and it's doing good just to stay in that spot and not to, nice. to evolve or move. So how do you, you keep that motivation going and that, that energy? That's a really good question. And um, again, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate for the motivational map because it helps you understand the way you're wired up and the things that motivate you. Um, but those people who may understand mapping and have listened to the, how I speak, it's very clear that I'm, I'm motivated by purpose. And um, we've got a very clear purpose as a business. And um, I think that that gives me what I call renewable energy all the time because 
we're never going to get there or it's like a lifelong ambition to get there right and i've got a set of i've got a set of ambitions for me personally and for the business as well um which is a life's work so i know that i'm gonna have to carry on working till i'm 80 to be able to get anywhere near uh, and i might never get anywhere near achieving those things but um it certainly gives me a good reason to get up in the morning and to keep pushing um you know it's day one back off holiday and it's nearly five o'clock and i'm flagging a little bit from an energy perspective because i work better in the mornings but yeah there's lots of things i try and do from a physical health perspective um to keep energized but mostly it's a mindset thing what would you say your biggest struggle from a staffing point is because i feel like for those that are leaders in the business that tends to be their biggest issue okay. potentially um because especially if they've done it alone before they know it's not their service or the, the product they're offering or they know it's not because they're struggling to provide it or whatever it may be but sometimes actually it's growing and those teething issues and those challenges of having the right people and having them work in the right times, places, all those things. And we've had a change in working styles with a COVID. So how have you felt like that's impacted you? And what would you say your biggest challenge is around staffing? Uh, biggest challenge around staffing, I think is, um, that's a really good question. That's a really wow. good question. Wow, I feel, okay. I feel <laughs> proud, guys. <laughs> okay, so, so staffing is a challenge full stop, right? Staffing is a challenge full stop because the, the issue you've got is we'll often have comp competing expectations about what a workplace is and isn't. Um, there's many play workplaces I come across that get um, that overstep that boundary um, because because people have work life balance to worry about. We get too involved in their lives and not enough of in, in the work. So I'm, I'm a firm believer if we come to work to do a good job and then we have a home life when we go home. And I think those boundaries are really important. So I know that's a little bit of a strange thing to say to you, Shani, because you do sometimes choose to send messages at 10 at night and things like that and what have you. And, and, and that, that's on you, right? It's up to you, right? But um, I will never knock anyone for turning their phone off at five o'clock at the end of their day. And I will never knock anyone for not doing stuff at the weekend or whatever, right? Because I think, I think it's important to have those boundaries. Uh, I think the staffing challenge is often around finding people because I think I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of people out there who want to do a good job but they haven't got the work ethic to do a good job. So I think I think there's a challenge there. I think there's a work a, a thing around work ethic. I think there's also there's a small amount of people who think that everything is the workplace's responsibility to fix. Like if people have got mental health challenges, it's the workplace's fault to fix. Uh, if people have got family issues, it's the workplace's fault to fix. Uh, if people have a puncture on their way to work and can't get to work on time, it's the workplace's fault to fix. And I disagree with that fundamentally. I, I totally agree with that. I think, I think people have to take ownership of their shit. So in that sense, I'm a little bit harsh. But on the other hand, I think it's a workplace's responsibility to be as flexible as possible to accommodate people to enable them to do, if they're contracted to do, to do 40 hours a week, to give them the best opportunity to deliver the best work they can in that 40 hour week, that's the workplace's job, right? So um, yeah, like I say, if you get a puncture on the way to work, not my problem, uh, but at the same time, I'll try and set up the workplace to enable you to it not have impacted your day as much as possible. Yeah. So that you can just bolt those times on somewhere else or whatever and make we're, the time. Yeah, we're all about reasonable adjustment. Um, yeah. But it's, it's making, it's, it's every, everyone's um, definition of the word reasonable, I guess. Um, yeah. But what would you say your top three tips to someone that is looking to employ their next uh, member of staff? What would you give them uh, as, okay, as a top guidance? three tip. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I think, um, I think in my opinion, Attitude trumps um, competence. Okay, so that's the first thing is looking for the right at attitude. Um, because I think 90% of most jobs can be taught to people. I think that experience often isn't as important as people say it is. Um, so I think, I think that attitude is really important and then that helps the learning process as well. Uh, and I think it's the workplace's responsibility to have the right systems and processes and training in place to ensure that people succeed. 
Um, I think there's a lot of people who fail in roles not do, due to their own fault, but to the workplace's fault. So attitude over competence, tip number one. Uh, I'm thinking off the cuff here. Uh, tip number two, it's a great question, by the way. Um, tip number two, I think, is to overlook your character preferences and understanding that we all have our own preferences and sometimes the person that we prefer is not the right person for the job. And what I mean by that is that there's this thing called cognitive diversity that I really value and think is really important. So um, we've all heard of the the boardrooms in the 80s and 90s and probably even today there's some of them where you've got boardrooms of white middle-aged fat bald men who make decisions around a company and um, there's no real consultation or input from any diverse thinking or any diverse diverse thought processes and I think that's a shame. I think it's really really important that other people have a voice with different backgrounds, different perspectives and um, I really value the opinions of everyone in the business and I don't want everyone to feel heard. So I think uh, I think it's really important that we look to try and diversify our team as much as possible and I don't just mean that from an ethnicity perspective I also mean it from, from a personality, personality yeah. perspective as well is what I mean there I think that um, it's good to have quirky characters um, and I think that you know if you have if you have a team of all like really sales focused people you end up with somewhere like the Wolf of Wall Street right and it's not a very well balanced workplace I think it's good it's good to have balance I think quirky people are good I think quirky people are good, and I think that the quirkier I find somebody, the that might be that might serve well for them from a work perspective. And you last it. Good question. Uh, did I go quirky as a second tip? That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> I don't. I, I'm, I'm hard finding it hard to explain what I mean. I think. I think the thing is, don't just go for people like you because yeah. you'll end up with an unbalanced business. And not only that, for example, in a lot of ways, we're quite similar. Um, but a lot of people might find us quite dominating or exactly um, yeah. quite l- like loud or bolshy, whereas we're not always suited for every customer, um, mm. whereas some of our staff are better suited for certain gigs just because they get on with better with those customers and whatnot. Perfect, yeah. And I think my third tip, thank you for buying me a bit of time there. Uh, my third tip is around um, the, the best people aren't always the one that interviews the best. And I think that it's really important to overlook the interview process. Uh, I think it's important to have a robust interview process, but I think it's really, really important to properly understand somebody before you employ them. So there are tools like motivational maps and those kinds of things. I think they're really useful tools for you to get to really know the person. And um, often you can understand that actually aligning them with the role effectively and, and getting a diverse set of perspectives and stuff like that can be really easily achieved by properly understanding who it is you're interviewing because what near enough an interview is really an exam as mm-hmm. a child yeah it's just it's a similar thing so a small minority of people probably have those those exam nerves and don't actually perform as well in exams but actually when it comes to coursework and things like that they perform outstandingly exactly so We've implemented things like inset days because we've realised actually we can do all the testing and the probing before, but actually are they going to have the initiative and the attitude when they're, they're there in in the uh, office or whatnot or out with our consultants? So I think that's probably another tip we could give. Absolutely, yeah. Very good. So what would be your advice aspiring leaders looking to reach a position like yours? Oof. Or how can you inspire, for example, the likes of other Shawnees out there that want to achieve what you have um, and sustain it for this long because we've reached quite a big milestone of being, we're over five years now. Mm -hmm. And to get to that point, a lot of small businesses don't. Yeah, they They don't make it. And especially in the time of COVID where you started, it was, it was a... Yeah, okay. Um, So, okay, what tips have I got? So I think the first one is... It, it becomes really important to know yourself really, really well and um, to not allow... Sometimes it's really easy to let your ego make decisions and actually that's not the right thing to do. And what I mean by that is that sometimes it's really nice... It'd be really nice to have, after your first year in business, to have a really nice shiny Range Rover parked outside. But actually, having a really 
a good understanding of actually now's not the right time and actually I've not been, you know, I've not done enough and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I think, I think to an extent you've got to be your own worst critic, but also your own best friend, which is a bit of a strange, a strange paradox. But I think, I think you need to have a real eye for where the shortfalls are and have a real sense of like realistic expectation of where you're at and how long things are going to take and being patient because it doesn't all happen overnight and it takes time and being persistent and really I think it's important to do something that matters so um, one of the things that I think I think what can happen is is if you're too desperate to chase money you repel it because money's energy and um, I think it's very I think it's I I believe in energy and I believe in in sort of um, law of attraction and all that sort of stuff and I think if you just chase money what happens is is people realize that you're just chasing money which makes them more reluctant to give you Mm -hmm. it Um, whereas I think if you become very mission focused and purpose driven um, around the impact you want to make then what you do is you inspire people to come on a journey with you and I think that's probably the biggest learning that I've had and the biggest most important thing that I think I could tell anyone who's aspiring to want to achieve something in their life is to go you know, this is the mission and this is the impact. This is the cause. This is what I stand for. And, um, and then, and then everything else kind of comes along with it. Um, but I think, I think you do need to have an eye on, so there, there's that. And then there's also having this eye on this realism of, you know, is it, what's the right next step? And, and sometimes people get too focused on the paralysis of what the 10th step is, but actually all you've got to do is like make the next right next step if that makes sense like the obstacle that's in front of you right now that's the way to go so whatever's causing you a headache now is to 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 push through that obstacle now and don't you might not be able to see what's behind it but you've just got to focus on that next best action people focus on things too far away you just got to do the next next best thing i'm just giving myself advice now um (laughs) uh, but yeah i don't i don't uh, I don't know what else I do else, have really. another question. Okay. So I would just say on my journey, which hasn't been, it's nowhere near to the same accolade as yours, but I've noticed in this short period of time, I've had to change my friendship circles. I've had to change a lot of things. So how have, how have you dealt with that? Because I feel like when you get to a certain level of success or your, out, uh, your mindset and things change, I feel like how do you you just establish who's right to keep around and who isn't? Because I feel really, like that's quite yeah. a hard thing to challenge. That's, with. A, that's a really, really good question. That's a really good question. And um, very tricky, very lonely for many business owners and entrepreneurs in particular. Um, I think that the, the advice that you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with is really true. Um, and uh, there have been times... It's really interesting. Um, There are times when I've needed to protect myself from negative-minded people because I haven't had the energy to be able to cope with their negativity. Um, And how I've justified that to myself is that by the time I can cope with it, by the time I've done what I need to achieve, they'll be back in my life and they probably won't even have noticed. So I've made a conscious decision to cut someone out for a period of time. It doesn't have to be forever. You can let them back in at a later point. Um, And I think it's that thing of just having this constant focus on, it's almost like self-absorption of, I just need to focus on me because all I can focus on is my next action, not what anyone else says or does. So it's having this focus on me and what I can do and the actions that I can take. Um, but yeah, there there is a level of needing to protect yourself and to particularly move yourself away from toxic people. Um, if you have them in your life, I'm I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. I've I've not needed to do that to too much of an extent, but there are, there are times when I've had to cut loose. So there is, um, there's an old saying, you, um, you can't fly like an eagle if you're flying with pigeons. So if you want to fly like an eagle, you've got to fly with other eagles. That was quite inspirational. Oh, thanks. (laughs) 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 Thanks, Shani. Just bring me back to ground. And what would you say to just round it off? Your biggest achievement (sighs) so far from a business perspective, because obviously we won't get kids involved because they're all your biggest achievement. (laughs) 
weird, isn't it? Talking about kids like they're an achievement. Oh, look at this trophy. Um, what's my biggest achievement? Um, Besides me, of course. I know I'm like your prodigy. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The project. Project, oh, project I'll, I'll write a book soon. It will say, yeah. Pete Rushman made me. Project Shani. <laughs> uh, amazing. Um, oh, what's my biggest achievement? Do you know what? It's really interesting, isn't it? Because you don't like to dine at the table of success for too long. And I don't. I don't, I'm not into self-flagellation and all that sort of stuff. Um, what's, what's my biggest achievement? Um, okay, top five then. Top, the, yeah, top there's, five greatest there's prob- moments Yeah, there's then. probably a few. So I'm dead proud of the Fleet Geeks podcast in the community. Yeah. Super proud of that. Uh, you know, as a small business, providing all of this resource, time and management and effort into a free resource for other people. And we invest in that because we have to pay for the editing and everything like that. So we don't create any income from it. Uh, but it's really important from a mission perspective to help people along the way. Um, so, yeah, proud of that. Uh, proud of winning the Young Entrepreneur of the Year. That was a bit of a highlight. <coughs> Not so young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, under under 40. So we'll stick with that, right? Um, it was a big achievement moving into the new premises. I that really was enjoyed it. Yeah, 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 that was that a big was moment big for moment. us. So there has been some big moments. Um, achieving goals that I'd set. So in 2018, 2019, I set some personal goals for material things that I wanted to be able to get. Um, they weren't huge things, um, but things like a season ticket for Man United was like a big goal for me and being able to achieve that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's like a boyhood dream. So And you just took yeah. all your kids, near enough all your kids. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, so, like the yeah, weekend, yeah. so that was a, bit, a nice moment. Yeah, yeah. You had and your I, little shirts on and everything. Absolutely. And I wanted to be able to take the kids on family holidays and stuff like that. So there, there, are, there are little things that happen. There are little things that happen that you just have to keep it real and realise the progress that you've made over a period of time. And would you say you still get that... Um... That sales buzz when you land a particular client or... Damn you, right. Yeah, Damn right. It doesn't that. matter if it's £100 a month or £10,000 a month. Um, there's a buzz in every bit of business that's won because the bit of business that's won is like a tick of trust that they've chosen to work with us over the competitor. And um, that's a win, right? It doesn't matter the man, the value of the money. It's about the win of someone's chosen to work with us because they've chosen flagship. They want to come be part of the community. Let's let's go on a, a funny one now, okay. just to end it on. I'm conscious we're going to get locked out in a minute. Go for it. What would you do if I left flagship partners? Fuck. <laughs> <hell>. um, <laughs> Just don't. You can't just, put it on recording. No, I you can't. Do. Just don't, Johnny. <laughs> don't, 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 because you're pivotal. She is pivotal, guys. So. And would you like any of your children to potentially, hopefully, take over this business? I think or? they've got their eyes on it, but I don't think I don't. Um, I don't. I'm not a fan of nepotism. So uh, I think if anyone was to take family business on or to do anything in the family business, it would be based on merit, yeah, rather than anything else. Um, so no, there's no. There's no free rides for any of the kids, for sure. One of my favourite things about, um, there's a thing, uh, Shaq O'Neal, um, he, uh, he uh, Shaq O'Neal has got this thing about the kids, obviously he's a very wealthy man, well, very, very wealthy man, but he'll say like, oh yeah, the kids come to me and go, oh, we're really rich, dad, didn't we? And he goes, nah, we're not rich. I'm rich. You're this not rich. Is, this is exactly what my dad says. Yeah, He's going to say, I'm going to piss up that inheritance at the wall. You ain't going to have nothing. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, is I've not had anything. I've never, you know, my parents, thank God, are still alive and I'd not trade them in for any type of money. Um, but um, I've, I think you, you appreciate it more when you've achieved it. Yeah, yeah. So I think... it was different when I was younger. Obviously, when I probably got to about 15, 16, this is where it cut off for me, any sort of money wise. But yeah. it was a big difference when I got my first job and that first pair of shoes or whatever I bought with my money yeah. versus it getting handed to you. You don't appreciate it as much. The sense of achievement isn't there and all those kinds of things. Wow. Yeah. I feel like before we're about to get kicked out. Yeah, we're about <laughs> to get kicked out, so you better, cut, you better cut it off. Can you leave them with an inspirational quote or, or a recommendation or something that you think that they should read? Because you like a good book. Ooh, I do like a good book. I, I'll give them a book recommendation. Wait wait six months and get the performance trifecta. Ooh. My, <laughs> shout out for my first book that comes out very soon. Lovely. Well, thanks for thanks listening. Sean. And we'll catch you next time on Fleet Geeks. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please share with your friends and colleagues too. Join us for free on Facebook with the Fleet Geeks community for transport and fleet managers. Fleet Geeks offers ongoing professional development, networking and mentoring too. So get in touch with me, Pete Rushmer, on any social media platform to find out more.